that I don't work readily when I'm really feeling good. It's like after sex, I'm not really in saying, hey, I'm going to do a great comic strip about how good it feels to have had sex. Uh, it just doesn't make me work. Or oh, look how beautiful nature is. Those things really don't get me to move to the table. It's always some degree of at least disquiet, if not disaster, that uh, allows me to like uh, marshal my forces and try to get something made. Every time I'm going to do a strip, it's because I can't avoid it, either because I need the money in the old days or now because I just need to think something through, make it manifest. At that point, I have to sort of reinvent the wheel. I have to get myself born through school, through therapy, through uh, my post-adolescence, learn to pick up a pen, find out what the pen is, what kind of paper one uses to make comics, what size one draws, and have to relearn everything in some ways. But basically, each strip is a kind of reinvention, even when it reinvents exactly the same way of doing it that I did before. That's just part of the process for me. Not a drawer like Enki Bilal is a drawer or some other karmic artists uh, who really, they draw and they draw from life and they pursue that. I kind of make lines on paper and kind of chisel them into being representative of what I need it to be. Uh, and uh, that kind of drawing that grows out of doodling, out of just making marks on paper, is really what uh, I began diving into with my mother as a kid where we would divert ourselves by making little scribbles and the other person would have to turn those into representational pictures. I was very, very young when they came to America. I have one or two flashes of memories from around the age of two when I was in Sweden. But then I do remember being on that uh, boat to America. I think I remember seeing the Statue of Liberty, but that could just be some movie, like interfering with my actual memory. I can never know. I think one of my earlier memories was being in a drugstore with my mother and seeing a collection of the earliest mads in a paperback format on a spinner rack that had just garbage around it uh, and being magnetized by it. Uh, it imprinted on me the same way that uh, little ducklings, if when they are very young, instead of having a view of their mother, have a view of uh, the farmer, they'll go following the farmer as if it was their mother. Mad became my parent. Uh, Mad became my window into an America beyond my parents' home, and it's what uh, taught me both to uh, read, look, want to be an artist, to make that kind of subversive work, and ultimately to take to heart the message that Mad was giving, which was basically, the media is lying to you, the whole adult world is lying to you, and we at Mad are part of the media. My parents didn't uh, love the fact that I was reading comics. They were not as severe as some children's parents who ripped them to pieces. 
they let me have them, and in fact, at some point, my father found he could get cheaper ones if they were used. So I got to see much better comics from before the comic censorship moment. The fact that he didn't know, and the fact that it was uh, some world away from my parents' world was certainly part of what beckoned me toward comics to begin with. One of the reasons I became a cartoonist is because it was outside of his sphere of understanding and interest. It gave me room to maneuver as a human. He was grateful that I was earning a living. But I remember at some point trying to shock him by showing him some of the pornographic drawings I was doing. I brought this big picture of a woman riding a, a human. Uh, I, uh, she was, I don't know whether she was small or the penis was large, but she was riding on the penis and there were a lot of creatures all around it. Uh, and uh, I showed this picture proudly to my father and he just looks relatively unfazed and says, hmm, so from this you make a living. It was more from my uh, mother that the notion that of being an artist seemed at least vaguely possible, although she too was uh, concerned about that as a career choice. With good reason, being a cartoonist is an insane way to try to make a living. I remember living in Coney Island, living in uh, uptown Manhattan, and by the time I get to Rigo Park, I have more or less continuous memories. Within that, my parents spoke Polish around the house. My father spoke Yiddish uh, as his business language, so I didn't hear it that often. Certainly, I was aware of my parents not being fully assimilated. My mother was painfully aware of her accent, uh, self-conscious about it, uh, but she spoke English really quite fluidly. I wasn't as self-conscious as she was about it, but I certainly remember uh, the uh, ways in which she was totally from some other planet, like when my friends would see the tattoo on her arm and ask her what it was, and she would just say it was a phone number she was trying not to forget. Um, so that was certainly an aspect of uh, growing up. The emotions that I was working with were very raw and un unchannelable. And uh, that expressionist style allows for uh, a direct screaming acknowledgement of, of uh, the screaming reality that catalyzed the strip. I never was especially interested in being uh, a drawer who would just swallow everything and present it the same way each time. And as a result, here in that Prisoner of the Hell Planet strip, it was very, uh, it was almost part of the synapse jump that was the electric buzz that led to me doing that piece. That style was uh, part and parcel of the thought. C'est une bande dessinée qui vous laissait euh, avec des questions et sans aucune réponse, euh, qui vous engageait en tant que lecteur, euh, où on se sentait pris à partie. Ce n'était pas une où une histoire était racontée par l'auteur avec une morale à la fin ou une bonne ou mauvaise fin, mais on rentrait dans l'état d'esprit de l'auteur. Après que Françoise a lu The Prisoner on the Hell Planet, uh, we talked on the phone, and she was trying to figure out how I could possibly have had such um, odd to her response to my mother's suicide as to be furious at her rather than devastated. The suicide of his mother, as well as his depression and the deportation of his parents, are treated in Breakdowns, a biographical portrait of the artist. Breakdowns was definitely about the disasters of breaking down and trying to find solace in form of comics as well as in the content. 
I think uh, I have a very unfertile imagination. I keep coming back to the actual things in my life. Breakdowns was originally a book that came out in 1970, end of 77, beginning of 78, gathering together some very short comics that I had made in the underground comics uh, San Francisco world that I was living in then. And the thing was, when I first, I, I knew I was going to be a cartoonist from the time I was about 11 years old. I think as soon as I gave up on Cowboy, uh, I chose comics. Uh, but this book came out, it made no impression in the world. It was like uh, barely published, it was privished. And it was uh, <laughs> privished in an edition of about 5,000. It took years to sell these books. In 2005, Art Spiegelman suggested to his editor that they release a longer version of Breakdowns, with an introduction covering his childhood, his parents, and the discovery of his own vocation as a writer. My editor at Pantheon said, what's this Breakdowns thing? I told him, he said, we can publish that. And I said, really, it has some hardcore photographic sexual panels in it, which were specifically the ones that couldn't get you distributed back in 1975 when I was doing them. And he looked at it and just said, what, the naughty bits? I felt really old. Um, <laughs> and all I really knew was that uh, I knew our culture existed somewhere between uh, Janet Jackson's uh, wardrobe malfunction <laughs> and Paris Hilton's videos, but I didn't know where. But he was willing to do it, so all I needed to do was make an introduction. So we d agreed that I just make a new introduction, putting this stuff in context. That would be that. Okay, where do I start? The Beverly. Okay. Voila. Thank you very much. Thank you. It is in this last edition of Breakdowns that Art Spiegelman talks about his beginnings in the underground art movement. At that time, he was a long way from making a living as a cartoonist, but he started as an illustrator for the multinational Tops, for which he created the famous cult collection, The Garbage Pail Kids. So I began working for that bubblegum company that functioned, as I've said, as my Medici, uh, giving me enough money for one day a week to keep me alive, the rest of the week to do uh, these absolutely non-lucrative but essential for me comics. <laughs> I had moved back from San Francisco in, I think, 1975, where I was editing a comics magazine called Arcade. And after the relationship I had in San Francisco broke up, I had the call of the wild, wanted to come back to New York. With Arcade, Art Spiegelman became one of the key figures in American underground comics. Arcade was the first magazine to publish the work of Robert Crumb and Charles Bukowski. But in spite of critical success, it was a commercial disappointment and shut down after just seven issues. It was at Arcade that Francoise Mouly first discovered Spiegelman's work. Francoise and I met, I think, for the first time while I was still doing Arcade magazine. When Francoise came to New York, she wanted to learn to read English, so she asked about uh, what comics could be interesting, not being able to find much here compared to France. I was living in a very small apartment in the village, and I pulled these boxes of old Little Nemo things out of the closet and just talked to her about those things, and uh, it was like inviting somebody up to look at your etchings or something. Melisay, Winsor McKay, Little Nemo, Melisay, George Harriman, qui sont des bandes dessinées très poétiques. Il me, il m'a donné tout un, un, un cursus de bandes dessinées, mais mais de façon privée. J'allais, j'allais le voir. Il avait un petit appartement dans le Village. Et la façon dont il me faisait la course, c'était de me lire des des PD. C'était presque impossible de pas s'enthousiasmer. Eventually, when she had to go back to um France, because like I said, she was playing hooky from the Beaux-Arts, pretending she was working on a project here. I felt bereft when she left, and it took a while for me to understand there are things called passports you can go get her. Uh, and, well, over the course of a, a year, we renegotiated, she came back. Then at some point, she wanted to publish books of graphics, maybe, and things like that. And she got interested in making a magazine. I said, no, never again. After Arcade, 
It was so harrowing. So as is usual, I would say no, and then we would do whatever she wants. Uh, that, that's been our pattern. And I always resist. Uh, and before I knew it, we were going to do a magazine, but I thought we were just doing it once. The thing that would happen is I was working for various magazines, and they'd say, oh, great, yes, look, we'll take you on as a consultant. We'd like to have more comics in the magazine, but it would be like high times. And they'd say, well, we need comics about drugs or Playboy. We need comics about sex. Um, and for me, I would talk to Playboy and say, but wait, you publish fiction by Nabokov, and it's sometimes sexy, sometimes not. That's not the point. Can't you give the same latitude to comics? Nobody could. Et je dis, écoute, il y a qu'à le faire. Hein? On a qu'à... Moi, j'aimerais bien le faire. Je vais, je vais l'imprimer moi-même. So, at that point, I sort of was thinking that what we were doing is making a kind of raw zero, just to show what could be in the world if the world was a better place for magazines, more hospitable to what we were doing. J'ai acheté une presse hein, et j'ai commencé à imprimer des trucs. Et j'adorais ce processus où uh, je pouvais penser à quelque chose et faire la mise en page, et, um, faire les négatifs, les plaques, j'avais des trucs, tout, je pouvais tout faire dans mon loft. Et y passer la nuit et le lendemain matin, j'avais des objets imprimés que j'amenais en librairie, je mettais un prix dessus et puis après je voyais si ça se vendait ou pas. One of the reasons we did Raw was to give uh, a platform to artists who had no other place to do what they did. And that was the, the motor behind Raw, to like let people who wouldn't see the work otherwise see it. It was just as true for publishing the European artist. I mean, now it seemed, now, now it's, it's, it's hard to remember what it was like at that point, but there was there was very very there was the underground comics that were pretty dead, like I said, and there was superhero comics, and there were there were not there wasn't there was nothing really that you would think of as kind of an alternative to that, and they kind of created that sort of that kind of new niche, I guess, um, where they were bringing you know international artists and finding a very you know unheard of unknown American artists as well and putting them together. Beer, everyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Maui. Anyway, originally I, I uh, designed these, trying to figure out lettering that was on the cover. Francois? Mm -hmm. I think I talked about that. And the first issue had a very small blurb that said, uh, submissions are welcome, uh, and there was an address at the bottom. Uh, and so I actually was, was very close by, so I, I walked around, I figured out where their home was and rang the doorbell and uh, and a very and in a few minutes later a very uh, frantic looking art spiegelman arrived at the door and i sat there with my portfolio and said ah uh, i have some artwork and he said ah uh, send me photocopies and so that was the very first meeting so the first significant place i was ever published certainly was raw magazine <laughs> So once we had started uh, doing Raw Magazine together, not the first issue, because I thought it was just a one-shot, but as of the second issue, I knew I had to merge these two projects, Raw and Mao's. So Mao's began appearing as one chapter at a time in Raw. Mao's is a comic about a father and son trying to understand each other. I think it's more directly that than it is about the Holocaust, you know? The first thing I did was start these conversations with my father so that there was a reason for us to be around talking uh, without him explaining I really could use a haircut and a day job. So. Here, we were able to sit with each other without quarreling. 
I was actually listening to him, which he liked. And oddly enough, uh, the horrors of the 20th century became our sanctuary, where we could actually be together peaceably. Much to my surprise, Vladek was, my father was very willing to sit down and talk with me. Where I just stayed with him, brought a tape recorder, and we spent all day getting the outlines of the story told. And that really, those first interviews, which went on for, I don't know, like maybe 10, 12 hours, were the core of what became Mouse. They were, had such a bad mustache. <coughs> and I also spoke always German when I came out. In the street, I didn't speak any other language, only German. If I went to somebody, somebody asked me only German. Because not so well, but I knew German better than the people who lived there in Oberschlesen. Because this was together. Chopinice, Katowice was together with us Soviets. It's a walking distance would go from one town to the other. And it was as if it was my birthright now that I was an adult. He just never wanted to talk about it when I was a kid and didn't really want to talk about it with anybody. Unlike my mother, he had no need to bear witness. His, his only response had been, people don't want to hear such stories. I know whenever I would mention it, people didn't want to hear. So he just muzzled it. In order to even understand what he was saying, I had to read uh, whatever was available on the subject, which wasn't so much. When I was beginning the book, it was not like now. It wasn't a river of books in English. Uh, and then I think in 78, uh, uh, Francoise and I went together to Poland to try to look around for the first time. It wasn't enough to talk to my father, because, for example, if he would say I was walking down the street, the word street to me would just conjure up like uh, Union Square. He was talking about something very different. And one might be able to get away with it as a writer, but as a comics artist, one has to really know what street, for example. Je crois que dans Mouse, Art, qui a vraiment un talent pour la concision, représente une scène où il me met en jeu et où on est dans la voiture où il exprime ses doutes sur. Comment est-ce qu'il peut représenter une réalité qu'il n'a même pas vécue et qui est uh, en deçà de toute compréhension par qui que ce soit Et il me donne une phrase hein, qui dit « Keep it honest, honey ». When I was working on Mao's, there wasn't such a phrase as second generation. I was that. The woman who either invented or popularized the phrase, Helen Epstein, was, uh, while I was teaching at the School of Visual Arts, she was teaching at NYU. She asked if she could show my Mao's booklets to her second generation therapy group. I said, sure, I'd be very interested in hearing what the response is to this work in progress. And then she never called back, so eventually I called her, and she was very tense on the phone. I said, well, what gives? She said, well, we talked about it. I said, yeah, that's why I'm calling. What, what was the response? Um, and she said, well, we decided you're not in touch with your feelings. And, um, and then she went on to say, and I've had nightmares about mice ever since. Um, so that was my first contact with second generation. After a certain point, uh, actually, I went to a second generation meeting. But I couldn't, maybe because I'm divorced from my feelings, identify thoroughly with uh, seeing my entire life through the lens of being a child of survivors. But I felt I could also be in an underground cartoonist support group or in a children of suicide support group, or people damaged by entering communes in the psychedelic 60s support group, or God knows which other ones, one of which could have been this one. Uh, but I think it was about the time at the end of the meeting when the person who was holding this 
group of, I don't know, maybe 100 people together, was announcing a second generation singles party that I realized this was not where I wanted to hang out and meet a mate. It was, the pickup lines at the bar would just be too awesomely painful, like, what camp was your mom in, you know? And uh, I just didn't need that. Right now, we drown in holokitsch. Every year, there's another Hollywood movie that uh, explains something about the poor SS woman who's learning to read in her Nuremberg cell or uh, the brave uh, Schindler who did, whatever, whatever it is. But that was a context very different than the one that existed, certainly in 72. And even when I was starting this work in 77 or 78, there wasn't that flood of material. What made the first book come out was when I got wind of the fact that Spielberg and an animator named Don Bluth, who was teaching in the same School of Visual Arts, got this way of uh, recuperating and changing what Mouse was into something quite, for me, creepy, but was much more commercial than anything Mouse could be, which is like, well, mice and cats, that's a good idea, uh, and perhaps anti-Semitism, but the Holocaust is too much of a bummer. Maybe we could kind of make it more like Fiddler on the Roof, and lo and behold, you had uh, uh, the American Tale movie coming out, and all I wanted was for him to shut up and stop making his thing till my book could come out. And that's really why the first part of Mouse came out as a separate volume before the whole thing was finished, in order to beat the movie. So I wouldn't be seen as uh, copying Spielberg both in his uh, conception and even in his name. You know, Spiegelman, Spielberg, it just would be too confusing. Since then, one of my greatest accomplishments has not been not letting Mouse become a movie and finding a way to not make Mouse 3. And certainly not becoming uh, thoroughly uh, connected to commenting and becoming an authority, passing moral judgment on every other work and uh, activity relating to Auschwitz. I do not want to be the Elie Wiesel of comic books. In 1992, Art Spiegelman won the Pulitzer Prize for Mouse. His father died before seeing his son's work completed. In 2005, Time magazine named Art Spiegelman as one of its top 100 most influential people of the century. The success really threw me, and it threw me into a great, not euphoria, but depression. I didn't count on success. I expected to have a kind of posthumous audience. Basically, from being interviewed on occasion because of these strange avant-garde comics in a tiny corner of the art planet I lived on, to uh, the New York Times, ABC News, um, People Magazine, all of them converging at the same moment, uh, I wasn't used to it. Now I'm a vet. I think I'm better at being interviewed than I am at making comics because uh, I spend more time being interviewed. Merci, Art. C'est gentil, un lapin pour un sourire. kind of a peculiar uh, oscillating relationship with the what I've been thinking of and calling the Spiegel monster that lives with us. It's this thing that kind of is my doppelganger that I can send out to the world when I need something, like money or a place to publish, but isn't exactly the same as uh, what I think of when I think about me. That 500-pound mouse chases me everywhere. I can't be unhappy about Mouse has landed uh, beyond my wildest uh, 
dreams for it, uh, which was for it to become an, a book in the culture, a real book in the culture. And at this point, it, is, uh, it seems to have achieved a kind of international canonical uh, status that I can only be grateful for, and on the other hand, makes it much more difficult to step away from it and make something. Après Maos, il a eu une longue période qu'il regrette plus pour lui-même que je ne regrette moi. Moi, je considère que ça lui aura pris une dizaine d'années avant de retrouver sa voix. Et c'est pas si long que ça, franchement, vu l'ampleur de ce qu'est Maos. Et dans ces dix années, il y aura eu dix ans de New Yorker et de couverture de New Yorker. After Mouse, I was invited into The New Yorker by the brand new editor, Tina Brown. Tina Brown got there, and then all of a sudden, The New Yorker was a magazine on amphetamine or cocaine, just moving a mile a minute, and that was the magazine I jumped onto. It's the couverture that they've done by artists. It's not illustrated by an article. Bien sûr, c'est la couverture du magazine, ça représente tout le reste du magazine, mais c'est le point de vue et l'idée, c'est signé par l'artiste, que ce soit Art Spiegelman ou Wayne Thibault, Saul Steinberg ou Bruce McCall. Je pense que ce que j'ai brought to The New Yorker était ce genre de image provocative. Son premier cover a causé une énorme controverse à travers l'Amérique. Son drawing d'un juif qui se fasse une femme blanche a été basé sur les Crown Heights racial rights de 1991 entre les communautés juives et les blancs communautés. Rumor had it that Hasidic Jews were using the services of black prostitutes. When the, the Hasidic Kiss Valentine cover happened, I, I knew it would be kind of a, a poke. I didn't realize that it would actually feel like a giant detonation of a bomb going off. That was the beginning of several rounds of detonations at the New Yorker. When the Monica Lewinsky Clinton scandal broke in January 1998, Spiegelman created the Lower Voice. But in September 1998, when Clinton's sexual life was made public in the famous Kenneth Starr report, Spiegelman submitted a magazine cover called Clinton's Last Wish. It was rejected. Next, he submitted Blind Justice after Clinton was indicted. That too was turned down. After the Clinton Monica Lewinsky story broke, Justice with a uh, Blind Justice now had a sadomasochistic, sexualized. Uh, a mask on rather than the blindfold. Um, and that to me, with the scale of justice that had a semen-soaked dress in weighing down one side of the scales, that to me was a really great snapshot. What happened with me, for instance, with this image I presented to the New Yorker as a cover, they wouldn't let me use the title I wanted. And thanks to all the little people who made this possible or something like that. It was one of the rare times where I, I uh, broke my vow to not be the Ellie Wiesel of comics. and I were outside in the streets that morning in Lower Manhattan, uh, right near the towers, and our daughter had just begun going to high school a block or two from the World Trade Center. A big sound happens and the whole like library shakes. And I looked out the window and I could see the Trade Tower really close. It was like three, four blocks away. I could see the Trade Tower and I could see um, a giant tear in it and there was flames coming out. There were like people crying because my friends who were in other classes had been glued to the windows and had been watching people jump out of the towers. Et ma réaction immédiate après, c'était d'aller chercher notre fille parce qu'elle était au pied de la tour. Et là, j'ai forcé Art à venir avec moi parce que je voulais pas y aller toute seule. Je l'ai traînée littéralement. Ça a pris très longtemps 
de la faire descendre. Alors, il y avait une panique pas possible dans l'école et rien n'était évacué parce que personne ne savait ce qui se passait. And I got to the 10th floor. My friend tells me, Nadja, your dad's looking for you. And suddenly I see my dad on the 10th floor of my school and he just looks so stricken and relieved to see me because my parents thought that we were all going to die at any minute. I mean, my mom studied architecture and it made most sense for the tower to fall like this. And if it fell like that, then it would fall onto the school. Nous sommes sortis du lycée ensemble et la deuxième tour s'est effondrée devant nous. happened in such slow motion that it really wasn't like watching the newsreels that happen over and over again on TV. The cloud of smoke that you see in all the newsreels started coming towards us and it overtook my school. And somebody who was standing next to us said, run, run, the smoke will kill you. That was one of the only times I saw my dad cry that day. I have not seen him cry that often, but that was one of them. Art Spiegelman and Francoise Mouly decided to issue a magazine cover that was black on black, where the shadow of the towers could only be seen by tilting the magazine in the light. I really thought we were going to die that day. Uh, and one of the things that passed through my head was, you schmuck, you really should have done more comics. As I started to try to return to making comics, there was only one thing that was still obsessing me, which was this kind of post-traumatic stress moment of what I had experienced that day. And so by December, I was already taking notes on what I might be able to make of uh, my September 11th. In 2004, Art Spiegelman published the album In the Shadows of No Towers, in which he told of his experiences on September 11th. Okay. I'll get the pen working again for that. It's an amazing format. Yeah, it uh, it's because I needed this big size, and my publisher wouldn't have a 10 page book this size. So uh, somebody at the New Yorker, a good production person, said, Oh, what you want to do is a baby board book, because then you don't have to worry about the seam, because it's boards pasted to each other. My favorite thing that happened with this book is I actually uh, was told by the person who runs the bookshop at Grand Central that there were two people um, looking at this book yeah. and they say, why did he make it a baby board book, says the girl. And the guy says, so our president can read it. <laughs> My kids were brought up uh, with the comics around the house, and in fact, as I said somewhere, I, I sacrificed uh, a great, very expensive on eBay comics collection to fatherhood. It's definitely true. He had this whole beautiful comics collection, which he sacrificed to my desire to read comics in the bathtub. Um, I liked to read in the bathtub, and I would always sort of like bring back these dripping wet comics to give to him. Growing up, I read a lot of comics that my dad didn't like. I liked to read the, the trashier comics. So I read like Richie Rich, I read the Archie comics, I really liked those. And my dad was always like, oh, those are trash. Wow. How's that? How's that? How's that? My mom told me recently, although I don't remember this obviously, that I learned how to read by reading comics in French. I, I guess Comics are definitely an important part of that puzzle. They're both very creative. So that idea from the early 50s that comics were creating illiteracy was a false thesis, I guess. Thank you. That's what I said when When we were doing Raw, I was like, comics, they're not just for uh, kids anymore. And, and now, uh, as we started with Little Lit and then moved into Francoise's Toon Book project and uh, to this uh, collection of 
early comics that we just finished working on, uh, we have to run around and say, no, 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 comics, they're not just for grown-ups anymore. My mom asked me to write a tune book for her. My dad didn't read it until it was finished, but me and my mom really worked together on it. I think it would be really enjoyable to work with my father. I think that it would, it would definitely be successful, but I think that for me, as an author, as, a, as someone who wants to create something, it's also really important for me to separate myself from his work. And so as much as that would be an enjoyable thing to do, at least for the next 20 years or so, I want to work on doing my own things. Something I ended up just working on, I did a, a, a large comics page. It's the last time I sat at my drawing table. And it's a one-page thesis about the relationship between comics and childhood. So uh, recently, I'm more interested than ever in comics as essay. How can you communicate a thought that's not just a narrative, not just a plotted story, even if it's a, a one based on my real life, but how can I communicate effectively these abstract ideas using the comics form. So that one page about uh, the nature of childhood, that's the last thing that's completed. Here's um, a shot of what the page looks like. and It's not published yet. Then over here on the left, you've got a character that is called the, sep the sexagenarian tot. That's me as a 60-year-old baby in a diaper. And after that, there's a postscript, a three-panel strip called Postmodern Papa. And it says, um, I first learned about the end of childhood of, on Halloween when my daughter was six. Ooh, Papa, let's trick and treat with Tara and Joni. Look at me, guys. I'm a butterfly fairy. What are you? Hi, Naja. We're big girls. Yes. And we're sluts. Yeah! Okay, in real life, it was my wife who took Naja trick-or-treating that year and told me about it after. But hey, it's only a comic strip, right? And then there's a panel of me reading uh, Mao's Upside Down, still as a tot, as a sexagenarian tot. That problem of why do I keep using myself as a character, it's by default. I just can't figure out another way to move forward narratively without uh, uh, relating to my own narrative movements through the world. I guess disaster is my muse. But sometimes it's only very little disasters. I don't need to have a plane ramming into a building next door to me or the deadly trauma of uh, my parents' experiences. Sometimes it's just the inquietude and discomforts of thoughts that are lodged in my head and phantoms that I need to work around. I'm scared about not having anything to work on every morning. But that was true well before Mouse uh, and continues to be true. It, well, while I was working on Mouse, I was scared that I wouldn't be able to figure out how to continue. Then after I finished, I was scared that I wouldn't have anything else to do. But uh, my process of working really consists of dying and getting reborn for each page. Uh, it's just part of the work process. So far, so good.